Welcome to the New Chemist Podcast. We're glad you're listening. Feel free to download this podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Here on the New Chemist, we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community, research, and COVID-19. We're happy you're tuning in. My guest today is Dr. Emery Brown. Thanks for joining me today. It is so good to hear from you. Just briefly, I'll inform my audience about you. Dr. Emery N. Brown is the Edward Hood Professor of Medical Engineering and Computational Neuroscience at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The Warren M. Zappel Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School and a practicing anesthesiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Brown received his BA, Magna Cum Laude, in Applied Mathematics from Harvard College, his MA and his PhD in Statistics from Harvard University, and his MD, Magna Cum Laude, from Harvard Medical School. Dr. Brown is an anesthesiologist statistician whose experimental research has made important contributions towards understanding the neuroscience of how anesthetics act in the brain to create the states of general anesthesia. In his statistics research, he has developed signal processing algorithms to solve important data analysis challenges in neuroscience. His research has been featured on National Public Radio, in Scientific American, Technology Review, The New York Times, and in TED Mid 2014. He serves as the director of the Harvard MIT Health Sciences and Technology Program, the associate director of the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science at MIT, an investigator at the Picor Center for Learning and Memory, Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. He's a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. In, in 2007, he was given the NIH Director's Pioneer Award He's also a member of the Association of University Anesthesiologists. These are just a few of his accomplishments. A very distinguished scientist. Please welcome Dr. Emery. Thanks, Dr. Brown, for joining me today. It's so good to have a distinguished scientist as, such as you um, on this podcast. So, Dr. Oh. Brown, um, what have been your longstanding interests in the field of science? Can you just discuss some of those? Well, I, I think they varied over time. I think that uh, probably my strongest interest in science began in college when I got interested in statistics. So to, being a statistician, developing statistical methods and algorithms that people could really use to analyze data became an early interest of mine. And that's something which I pursued you know, throughout my career. First, working on studying outcomes from surgery as an undergraduate then later studying circadian rhythms during my PhD work. Okay. After that, looking at developing algorithms in general for neuroscience data analysis, for looking at neural spike trains, for looking at EEG, LF, local field potentials, and these sorts of things. Okay. And then <clears throat> from there, my interest developed into trying to understand anesthesia. So I'd say those are probably the, the principal focus areas. So statistics, and then statistics applied to neuroscience, and then uh, anesthesiology, the mechanism of general anesthesia. So I think by any any standard of measurement or most standards of measurement, most people would say you have been a successful academician. Uh, you have got, achieved your PhD from Harvard, your MD from Harvard, uh, MA from Harvard, BA from Harvard. You've won numerous prizes. You're part of many societies, the National Academy of Inventors, National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine. So how do you maintain view of the bigger picture in your career and in your life in general? How are you doing that? And, and so when you say the bigger picture, you're referring to? Academically and also personally. How do you maintain view of the bigger picture in terms of like the overarching goals that you have set, your mission statement, your vision for your life? Well, I, I, I think that uh, one of the things that I've tried to do is try to work on an important question. Okay. And what you find out with important questions is you can't solve them in five minutes. So mm -hmm. that necessarily creates like a long trajectory. So for example, the problem of thinking on how does anesthesia work? And that's something which has been a question for now coming here 175 years. And so 
picking a part, picking part of that and going after it, you know it's something which is going to be, it's a challenging question. And if you're able to solve it, it's gonna have broad implications, not only for taking care of patients, but also for neuroscience in general and science in general. So that's the sort of things I've, I've tried to work on, like picking important questions. So as another illustration and thinking about circadian rhythms, circadian rhythms are everywhere. They control our, our daily function. So the more we're able to accurately quantify how they, their, their properties, again, it has broad implications. So I guess the two sentence summary would be picking um, important questions and pursuing those important questions. Okay, yeah, that's good, that's good. So in what specific ways for the layman, uh, have you been adaptive and creative in the field of science? What specific ways? I know you work with anesthesia, I know you've been a statistician. What specific ways have you added your flair to those fields? Well, I, I think that uh, if we start with like the circadian rhythms, I think right there was the, the main thing that I did was in looking at the data that were being recorded at those times, like looking at core temperature rhythms to track mm -hmm. the circadian system in, in patients or in study subjects. Mm -hmm. I worked to get an accurate description of those, of those oscillations. Okay. So trying to make the model capture the structure and the data as accurately as possible and using what we call harmonic regression techniques to do that. Mm -hmm. But then not just stopping there, but developing a full inference framework. So you could actually, you could measure the aspects of the rhythm, you know, say the period, the mm -hmm. amplitude, and then from there be able to make statements of uncertainty about, you know, how confident we were about the characterizations that we came up with. Wow. So that allows you to have, uh, an inference framework. And then going on to some of the other work, like looking at neuroscience data, mm -hmm. the same idea in principle, and but there's a key concept there that I was able to take advantage of and use, and I've continued to use throughout my career, and that is neuroscience data, because the re you're recording from the brain and central nervous system is dynamic. It changes over time. Mm -hmm. And you need statistical methods that also capture those changes over time for it mm -hmm. to be accurate. And so those were things that I was practiced in that I learned as part of my PhD training. So whereas most of the methods that were being used are static. Mm -hmm. And so you, it, so then it becomes like a clue to really use them. <clears throat> so by starting from a frame where I already had methods that were dynamic, mm -hmm. that capture phenomena that changed over time, I was able to develop more accurate descriptions of those sorts of data as well. So in other words, really understanding the properties of the data, that really what the essential elements of the problem are. I think that's something which I tried to focus on and that's, you know, yielded me some, you know, some measure of success to, to date. Yeah, I would say so too, it did. So um, how have you sort of found the right environment for you to thrive scientifically and intellectually? I, I, I think a lot of people aim or aspire to be at institutions such as Harvard and other institutions as well. Um, so how did you find, how do you know that was the right environment for you to thrive in scientifically and intellectually? Well, I can't say that I knew it. I mean, I, I think I was just like any other student starting off at, you know, like Harvard, you, you know, really in many respects impressed by what the institution had to offer. Mm -hmm. But then once I was there, then saying, well, I really have to take advantage of this. And I remember specifically that um, when I was a when I was a junior and I was thinking about what I wanted to do for my senior, my research for senior thesis. Uh, Ken, Ken Wachter, who was a professor in the statistics department at the time, said, well, since you're thinking about going to medical school, you should probably write a thesis, an, an undergraduate thesis on a medical topic. And he suggested I go and talk with Professor Ken, sorry, talk with Professor Fred uh, Mosteller about that particular issue mm -hmm. and, and work do, developing a research project with him <clears throat> because he was a statistician who was working on studying outcomes from surgery. Okay. And that this would be a good idea for me to, to join a project like that. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So I guess the key thing was realizing that um, what sort of opportunities were there mm -hmm. at Harvard and then taking advantage of them. Because you could certainly be there and not take advantage of opportunities that were there. That's true. I think one of the real things that I think it was the case at the time, I think it still continues to be the case, the opportunity to write a, a, a senior thesis with, you know, a leading scholar in an area is something which, you know, was had, was amazingly beneficial for me for the long term. Mm -hmm. it, it got to watch up close and personal how, you know, one of the top statisticians in the world did research. I got to see, you know, how he how he thought, how he interacted with, you know, 
other scientists, other physicians, with, uh, with physicians. And, and it, it was very helpful for me to think about the sort of scientist, and in my case, also a physician that I wanted to be and the way I'd like to be able to, to do research. And being very specific, one thing about Professor Mosteller was that he could work with anybody. He could work with the best statistician, you know, the top physicians, mm -hmm. graduate students, postdocs, but he could also work with undergraduates like me. And so having, you know, just basically seeing that, and I can honestly say that's something I've tried to emulate. Oh, wow. That's good. That's definitely good. So um, you speak about uh, your desire to attend medical school in your junior year. So how did you delineate or decide between MD, PhD, or MD? Because I think that's a lot, that's a challenge that a lot of people encounter. How did you differentiate whether you want to choose MD, PhD, or MD? Well, I, I think what happened was, is I knew when I came to college, that I wanted to go to medical school. That was for sure. Okay. And I can't remember exactly or whether it was in my sophomore year or, or earlier, but I decided I wanted to do a PhD also. Okay. And I, when I, once I really fell in love with statistics, which was between sophomore and junior year, mm -hmm. I decided I wanted to do my PhD in statistics because I just liked the, I really liked statistics. It was just very powerful paradigm, very powerful framework was and still is. Mm -hmm. And, and I just wanted to, to master that. And I thought that, but I also wanted to be a physician. Mm -hmm. And I thought as opposed to just compromising and doing one or the other, why not do both? And that was how I just made the decision, mm -hmm. which was a fairly avant-garde idea at the time, because um, when I entered the Harvard MD PhD program, nobody had done a PhD in statistics before. That was a rather new idea. There was a new idea there, uh, there, but also in other programs in the country, because it was a people looked at me with a lot of surprise when I met, when I said that's what I wanted to do my PhD in. But it was very clear to me that you know medicine was a field that had a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. a lot of data and even more now and having people who are formally trained in how to quantify that uncertainty and make decisions on uncertainty just seemed like a natural path and that's what i just decided to do yeah that's good that's good so given all your responsibilities and accomplishments dr brown how do you maintain a balanced life or are, how are you, are you strive to maintain balance well it, it's um you know i i, I think uh you know Family is first. There's no question about that. Yeah, yeah. And you know the uh, the accomplishments are basically no fun, and they have they have no luster. You know if your family isn't well taken care of and your you know your family isn't happy. Mm -hmm. and so you know we spend a lot of time you know on you know downtime on the weekends, vacationing you know during the summer, spring when the kids were. And when the kids were younger, sort of making sure we took, you know, vacations during the four seasons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my wife, like me, likes to travel. So we, and then very often, if I have trips to various places to give lectures, we turn them into sort of family outings also. Okay. So you know, by, by doing that, it's made it possible to, um, you know, pursue activities that are relevant to my career, mm -hmm. but also make sure that, you know, I'm not losing sight of my family. Yeah, that's good. Priorities, having priorities. I've heard that uh, in several interviews that having priorities that they do complement to maintaining balance. So what would you attribute to your success as a pioneer in the field, Dr. Brown? What would you attribute? Uh, what characteristic? What was it your upbringing as a child? Was it your time at Harvard? Or was it your belief system, your perspective on life? What would you say as complement your success as a pioneer in the field? Would it be mentorship? I, I, I think that I think that my parents and my family de deserve tremendous credit for okay. you know sort of setting me on the right track. And it's, so, for example, I mean, both of my parents were teachers. They felt that education was very important. Okay. Any time I wanted to do something or pursue something, they were always behind me. Mm -hmm. And then you know my my brothers were were always very very good in school also. Okay. And so people would always say, well, you're going to be as good as your brother, you know, sort of things. So that also created a certain amount of incentive. But not only my brothers, but my cousins, too. Uh, they were also really very good in school. And, uh, and, and so, so, in other words, there were these, a number of, like, you know, sort of role models around, which wow. 
I don't think we use that term then. We think of them that way, but there are people you want it to be like. So now we would call them role models, right? Okay. But, you know, one of my cousins, uh, Robert Brown, who went to, uh, you know, Carnegie Mellon was a star basketball player, honor student. And he was always sitting around reading books, you know, during the summer. I mean, so I'm just, so I mean, that that's the image that I, you know, that I had of him or one of my cousins who was, uh, you know, who, what was when we were kids was teaching us lines from HMS Pinafore, you know, that sort of thing. Wow. Or, and so, so the idea, so being smart was cool, essentially. That, that, yeah. was, that was, I think I can, I really remember that idea. And like, the, the, you know, the smarter you were in this environment around our family, kind of like, you know, the cooler you were. Wow. So, and, and so I think that kind of instilled this in me. Or for example, like when I, my oldest brother is a very good writer. Mm -hmm. And my, my middle brother was a physicist, wow. or, you know, just a retired physicist now. Mm -hmm. So again, you, you, it, it didn't seem like that at the time, but they were implicitly setting bars, mm -hmm. you know, for me to try to jump over wow. just by what they were doing, you know, by example. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, I think those, those, uh, I think those are the origins. And then, then realizing once you had opportunities, mm -hmm. You took advantage of them. Yeah. And then you have some serendipity. You have some people who realize that you have, you know, potential and they try to help you realize it. Mm -hmm. Like my language teacher at Exeter, you know, Mr. Bajia, mm -hmm. who spoke like five languages. And so I wanted to be like Mr. Bajia, you know, you, you know, try to be as proficient in as many languages as he was. Yeah. Or for example, when I was at, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, one of the anesthesiologists there, Dr. Uh, Jack McPeak, mm -hmm. you know, took an interest in me. He was one of my my thesis advisors, mm -hmm. and he's the first person who took me to the operating room. And then, wow. you know, several years later, when I decided to go into anesthesiology, I was able to turn to him and get advice, and he helped me, you know, arrange to take, you know, a rotation in anesthesiology, and decided that I, that's what I wanted to go into. Wow. So, in addition to, so so then, so it's, it's a number of things. It's not just it's wow. like any one thing. That's fair. But, you know, so some, I'd say some young, some early on, some folks that I really looked up to, later on, some folks who realizing and acknowledging my potential, you know, who helped me out. And I, I was very grateful for that. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah. So you, you spoke, and from my understanding, it seems like you grew up in a culture of excellence. Of mm -hmm. course, I'm sure there were things that could have been improved on, but um, you said you grew up in an environment where it seems like everyone was pursuing excellence what what would you say would you say it was your parents or their brothers and sisters that contributed to that oh yeah that? yeah for example yeah like so my mother's family my mother's family grew up in pittsburgh and uh, mm -hmm. the uh my mother and her older sister so that my mother was one of seven children okay and uh so she was the second oldest and her sister was was extremely smart you know oh, okay. her older sister my mother was extremely smart. She graduated from high school and she was 16. Wow. I remember my uncle, who was the next one in line, the third one was saying to me, he says, you know, your mother and Anna, and your and your aunt Anita made it hard for me because they had done so well in school. I had to do well too, you know, that sort of thing. Okay. And, you know, yeah. on the other hand, my father was very industrious. I mean, he was someone who was orphaned. When he was 14. He and his brother had lost both his parents. They were raised by their grandfather. Wow. But, they had someone who, my, my, his grandfather, my great grandfather was this amazing guy. He was a minister, but he was also a gentleman farmer. Okay. And he owned this very large parcel of land, mm -hmm. you know, there in, in Florida where I grew up, which we still own today. Okay. And that he was an amazingly industrious person. And I know that rubbed off on my father because my father was always doing stuff both for the family, but also for the community, he was very committed to his, uh, you know, his com his community. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, in fact, I know that, you know, I inherited that that, that perspective, you know, those mm -hmm. goals, those sorts of uh, the, the, the sort of uh, the, the sort of can-do attitude that my father, you know, always had. And I'll just give you one example, like okay, um, I'm here to listen. At the time. Uh, my father's 
grandfather wanted him to move back to Florida because after he got married, they lived in New York and in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> he wanted him to move back because he wanted somebody living on their property. So my father decided to build a house. So this was in the ninth, about 1957, 1958. Yeah. Um, and as you can imagine, my father couldn't get a loan from the bank to build a house. Mm -hmm. And and as we know, one of the, the most important things entering into the into the American dream is to be able to build a house and you know lay down mm -hmm. roots, right? Yes, I agree. So I didn't know this until many years later. Um, he actually borrowed money from the auto body shop to build a house. He couldn't oh. get a loan from the bank. Wow. And I remember when we paid off the note, I was, I don't know, I must have been about 10 or 11 at the time. And I didn't quite understand everything, you know, that was going on, but I subsequently figured out what had happened. Mm -hmm. But, but the thing was, is that because the conventional means that most, you know, Americans would have used to build a house, getting a loan from the bank and doing that, um, was, wasn't available to him. He had to come up with another strategy yeah. that would work. Mm -hmm. And he did it. And so I think about that now. I mean, think about if he'd not been able to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, where would I, you know, where would I be now if that, if, if he hadn't done that? Mm -hmm. And so, but then taking from that, realizing that if people put obstacles in your way, you have to re, you have to outthink them. Yeah. I mean, and, and I've seen myself do that, like on a number of occasions. But, but I mean. But that was probably one of the most, you know, concrete examples because mm -hmm. the people at the bank couldn't believe that an African American would want to build like a real house, you know, like a solid, you know, three bedroom, you know, two and a half bathroom, you know, living room, floor to room, mm -hmm. you know, outside porch, you know, house. They, they figured we'd just have some idea of like a little shanty or something like that in mind. But that was that was far from what my father had imagined because he had studied industrial arts in college, so mm -hmm. he knew how to build things. Okay. And with the help of his brother and his uncles, they actually built the house. Wow. Wow, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. I'm learning a lot, Dr. Brown. So um, how have you maintained vision and teamwork in your environment, in your lab, in your workspace in Mass General? Um, how do you maintain vision and teamwork? How do you make sure that everyone's collaborating and seeing the big picture and trying to answer those important questions that you mentioned? I, I think I think there are two things. I think one, you 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 look for you look for cool problems, okay. and you get people excited about cool problems. I think that's the starting point. Mm -hmm. And then you know you you let people loose and let them use their creativity to start working on. You guide them. Mm -hmm. But at least this is what I like to do. I like to guide people to help them solve problems, and then pitch in you know when they you know need my help because it allows them to develop their creative. Their, their creative capacities and and you know bring them to bear on a, on a problem mm -hmm. um I, I think that that's probably the most important thing and also making it fun i mean mm -hmm. you know i uh i feel like in many regards now i'm more a cheerleader than anything else i'm not so much the person like doing the work i'm just the rah 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 you know yeah okay. keeping them going and uh, offering suggestions and making sure people aren't getting stuck Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that's that's probably the main thing that I do, and mm -hmm. and I can honestly say it, it's fun. It's it's fun working with. You know, it's watching people who are you know many years my junior master concepts that I didn't master until I was like maybe twenty years older than they were, and like wow, they know this stuff already. You can only imagine what they can do or what they'll be able to do. You know, going on into the future, mm -hmm. and so just sitting there marveling at that and trying to facilitate that is a real pleasure. And I, and I, I, uh, I, I try to keep that going on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, wow. So uh, as we start to wrap up, you mentioned how being smart was cool. I, I can be wrong with this. However, I'm not sure if that's the, the prevailing message in many instances or in many circles. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say could complement a change in that dynamic? Um, where it's not just the athletic environments that have uh, a lot of attra uh, attraction to them for young people, but academic environments as well, you know, how can we make that a more prevailing message? That intellectual curiosity and intellectual development is worth the time and effort. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think we really have to, I mean, I, I'm clearly biased because I'm an, I'm an academic, I'm in science, and I, you know, yeah, I feel so. you know, that people should know about yeah. you know, academics and science and, and those sorts of things. But, but I think that, you know, you know, I'm indebted to you for taking time to talk to somebody like me to allow me to tell my story. Oh, because, wow. you know, it's, you know, it, what's, it's more exciting to know, to hear about Jadim, Jason Tatum having scored 50 points and won the game for the Celtics than oh, definitely. to hear about what I'm doing, you know. <laughs> so, and, and that, that's just the realities of it. That's true. But, however, you know, being able to, like, for example, I, I have three, so after my father, I have like three heroes, additional heroes in mathematics. You know, one is Benjamin Banneker, you know, the black mathematician mm -hmm. who laid out DC. Mm -hmm. He was the first person to really characterize the cycles of the circadia, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, you know the, the insects which come, which come out every 17 years. Mm -hmm. So he was really, and he did this over something like four or five cycles. So he started when he was 17. Okay. And so he was probably the country's first data scientist when you think about it. <clears throat> or another person is Catherine Johnson. When I learned about her, I was just like blown away. Mm -hmm. You know, basically the woman mathematician, African-American woman mathematician who worked out the flight trajectories for the early um, Mercury and I think also Gemini space missions. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think about it. She did the calculations by hand. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that, that's, that's just like unreal. And the third person who actually had the good fortune to meet is David Blackwell. He was mm -hmm. African-American professor at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, professor of statistics. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like an amazing mind, soft-spoken, just totally respected because he was just so, so brilliant. First mm -hmm. African-American elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1964. So. Well, more than 100 years after the academy was actually set up, the first African American was elected. He was, it was he. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think about, you know, people like that. And I'm saying, gosh, if I can be anything like those guys, you know, so, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, clearly the accomplishments of a, of a LeBron James or, or a Magic Johnson are the things that are, you know, are often talked about. But, like in my realm, you know, I see somebody like these people and they're like my, they're my heroes. And those are the people mm -hmm. I aspire to be like. Yeah, that's good. So as we conclude, do you have any advice to those wanting to pursue the field you are currently working in? So budding scientists, um, what, what advice would you give to those wanting to pursue the field you are currently working in? Whether it be statistics or medicine or just a PhD in general. Um, I, I think they try to get involved and gain, gain experience early. Um, okay. I can tell you, I get letters almost every day from students asking to come and work in my group. Okay. Literally, and of different ages, all the way from junior high school, you know, up through, you know, high school, college, postdocs. And I'm amazed at what some of these students have told me they already know. Mm -hmm. They're not, some of them are from the United States, some are from, not. They're from outside, from basically effectively the four corners of the earth. Mm -hmm. And so, but realizing that that's what people do and not being bashful about doing that. And if the first time you write somebody, you don't hear from them, no big deal, keep going. If you want yep. to, go, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's, 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 you're trying to create, because all you need is one opportunity to sort of get your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. Once you have that and you realize and the other opportunities will open up. Mm -hmm. And I you agree. can see that this is something that students from a number of different backgrounds are actually doing now. I, I think that students in general, particularly perhaps, you know, underrepresented minority students, mm -hmm. feel free to take the same, the same approach. I agree, completely agree. So what has been some of the most beneficial advice you have received, Dr. Brown, as we conclude? What was the most beneficial advice or piece of the beneficial advice that you received either from your parents, as you mentioned, they were very industrious and intelligent, um, even from your colleagues or professors. What, what has been some of the most beneficial mm -hmm. advice you've ever received? Does it ever work? I, the, the most, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, a, a number of things. I think, uh, you know, just in watching like my parents, you know, just 
like working hard and, and also, but then encouraging intellectual pursuits, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think I certainly have picked up on that and tried to amplify that. I just remember my mother saying at one point, like I told you, she was extremely smart. Mm -hmm. and, you know, she was, it was very clear she lived vicariously through us, you know, the things mm -hmm. we were able to accomplish, you know, not only me, but my brothers as well. Mm -hmm. And one point in sort of a more candid moment, she said, you know, if I had had opportunities, I'm sure I could have been, you know, a lot more than I am now. Yeah, I've heard that same sentiment from Alvin and that, as well. I mean, that kind of stuck with me and just sort of said, well, you know, I have an obligation to try to be as successful as I possibly can because my mother made it possible for me to get to where I am now. Mm -hmm. And she sacrificed a lot to, to be where she was. And, uh, and, and I, I should, you know, I should basically do the same thing. Mm -hmm. and then a compliment, a complimentary idea. I just, remember, I, I just remember my uncle saying once that, you know, it never hurts to be nice. Mm -hmm. And so if you can help somebody, why not? You know, just, I know, right. Just, just that simple, not deep, but just, yeah. And it can take on many forms. It can just be meeting someone on the street to helping someone with their career. So mm -hmm. I think some, somewhere in there is some of the best advice I've received. Yeah. There are probably other things, but they don't come to mind right now. That's fair. That's fair. Well, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining me today. It was good to have you on. Oh, thank you very much for having me, Dave. I really appreciate it. Chemistry field highlights. Femtochemistry. So surveying the literature, I'm looking at the work of Yoshitaka Tanamara, Kochi Yamashita, and Philip A. Anfinrad. We embark on a new discussion, femtochemistry. In short, a key feature of, the chemist of chemistry is the hemolysis or breaking and or the formation of bonds, which some consider to be theoretical constructs in some instances. A key feature of the elementary steps of bond making and breaking are molecular vibrations which occur approximately at the 10 femtosecond scale. So okay, with this view in mind, ultra fast processes um, are or is a phrase that can definitely describe chemical reactions and has been umbrellaed or covered or falls under the term femtochemistry. Chemistry conceptual developments. So today we're going to be introducing or talking about regiochemistry principles. So key things you want to keep in mind are you want to understand the fundamentals of regiochemistry, understand Markovnikov's rule and the anti-Markovnikov's rule, and we want to try and understand Zaitsev's and Hoffman's rule. So regiochemistry principles and other ideas. Regiochemistry comes from the Latin word regionum, meaning direction. Regiochemistry describes the principles involved in the directionality or position and placement of reactants to form products. Regiochemistry is very important. We normally hear in advanced or high level discussions of things being regioselective or regiodivergent or, regio or it's, it's very, it's used a lot. So the reagent use can cause a specific regiochemical result or result in the opposite of what would normally occur. Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule, put simply, is he who has more gets more. Markovnikov's rule in the addition of a halide to an unsymmetrical alkene, um, typically in the addition of a halide to an unsymmetrical alkene, the hydrogen goes to the carbon with the greatest number of hydrogens and the halide ion goes to the other carbon. In another way, this rule states that the halide adds so as to form the more stable carbocation intermediate. Anti-Makovnikov. Anti-Makovnikov is the reverse. He who has more gets less, in which the carbon with the greatest number of hydrogens does not receive the hydrogen, but the most electrophilic portion of the molecule. For example, in hydroboration oxidation in the presence of peroxides, the borohydrate adds to the less substituted carbon of the hydrogen, and the hydrogen adds to the more substituted carbon. In short, now mechanistically, it may occur slightly it's a little bit more involved and more detailed, but in short, that's what we're going to say occurs. Um, however, the stability comes about because the electron density shifts from the electrophilic borohydride resulting in it possessing a partially negative charge and the more substituted carbon possessing a partially positive charge. 
This is indeed stable due to the electron density donating capacity of the alkyl group S character and orbital overlap of the alkyl carbon. The alkyl group with alkyl or electron donating substituent provides stability. Deutzer's rule. Deutzer's rule is a directionality principle in which the more substituted alkene is favored to the use of a small base, such as ethoxide. Um, Deutzer's rule is very significant and aids in predicting products and elimination reactions. Hoffman's rule. Hoffman's rule is another directionality principle in which the less substituted alkene is favored to the use of a huge or large base, uh, such as tritbutoxide. Hoffman's rule is also very significant and aids in predicting elimination reactions. Hammond Leffler postulate. The Hammond Leffler postulate essentially states that the product resembles the molecular arrangement of the transition state. In simpler terms, the view on the potential energy hill continues in some ways as you follow through the potential energy journey. So progressing in that direction, we're going to talk about some new stuff today. Again, surveying the literature and looking at the work of Shan Tanu Roy, Stefan Gadeka, and Vladimir Hellman, we embark on the journey of the Bell Evans Polanyi principle. So typically, uh, or in short, the Bell Evans Polanyi principle is valid uh, for a chemical reaction that proceeds along the reaction coordinate over the transition state. And that concept is extended um, to molecular dynamics trajectories that in general do not cross the dividing surface between the initial and final local minima at the exact transition state. It's very important and it has a lot of implications. It's a conceptual tool in physical chemistry and we have come to understand that this principle can be used to improve the efficiency of existing molecular dynamics based methods by tuning the energy of these molecular dynamic trajectories. Along with that, we'll be discussing the Dimroth principle or Dimroth rearrangements. These are frequently encountered in heteroaromatic chemistry and was first recognized in the triazole series. Um, this term was coined in 1963 as a convenient way of referring to the isomerization proceeding by ring fission and subsequent recyclization, whereby a ring nitrogen and its attached substituent exchange place with an amino group in a position alpha to it. Moving right along. We discuss a mechanistic highlight. Today we'll be talking about the Suzuki cross coupling reaction. The Suzuki cross coupling or the Suzuki Miura cross coupling is a type of palladium catalyzed cross coupling reaction. CC bond formation using aryl halides and organoboronic acids it is one of the most important reactions in synthetic organic and medicinal chemistry. There are two suggested pathways. The oxo-palladium pathway is a preferred mechanism, as some may say, and the boronic pathway is another um, description of what occurs. Of course, these occur through catalytic cycles, and this reaction was likely first described around 1979. In 2010, Akira Suzuki, jointly with Richard F. Heck and I Ichi Nagishi, received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the development of palladium catalyzed cross-coupling reactions. Wrapping up the highlight section, we'll talk about Nobel highlights. So Savant Arrhenius. Savant Arrhenius was born on February 19th, 1859 near Uppsala, Sweden. He received the Nobel Prize on December 10th, 1903 in recognition of his theory of electrolytic dissociation. His father, Savant Gustav Arrhenius, held a position at the University of Uppsala. His uncle, Johan Arrhenius, was a botanist, writer, and a longtime secretary of the Swedish Agricultural Academy in Stockholm. Savant Arrhenius was an outstanding student in school. He learned reading and arithmetic at a very early age, and in his secondary school, excelled particularly 
in mathematics and physics. His physics teacher was M. Flores, author of the most popular contemporary Swedish secondary school physics textbook. His university degrees were all from the University of Uppsala. Definitely a chemist that worked hard. This ends the session of highlights for this podcast episode. Thanks for listening. We're glad you were able to tune into this podcast. Once again, this is The New Chemist, where we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community, research, and COVID-19. Thanks again for listening. Note, the views on this podcast represent those of my guests and I. Thank you.